All right, well, I, first of all, I wanted to thank um, the group who helped put this together. Um, of course, Tim, um, thank you for agreeing to do this presentation. I'm really looking forward to it. I've been wanting to see what you have to say about all this for quite some time. Um, and thanks to Sydney and Mike, of course, from the AIA and Linda and Donald, um, our fearless leaders for the committee. Um, so um, so who, who is Tim? Tim is an architect and a contractor and a longtime advocate for renewable energy. Having worked in the solar industry as well as spent many years focused on sustainable design in his architectural work, he, um, his new venture called We Vault is dedicated to helping people understand and optimize the transition away from fossil fuels and towards the use of 100% clean electric energy for their homes. So residentially focused. Um, and that's it. I've known Tim for, gosh, 15, 20 years. We've done work together. We used to share office space. Um, and as I said, I'm very ex excited to hear this presentation. So take it away, Tim. All right. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, so uh, just the starting point, I guess, is to ask the question, uh, what is decarbonization and why do we care about it? You know, as architects, we've all had... Uh, understandings of a lot of different concepts when it comes to sustainable design. You know, there's net zero and there's, you know, carbon free and there's, there's all of these uh, concepts that sort of uh, float past us without, you know, and they, and they be, there's some nuance to each of them. Uh, and today we're going to specifically talk about decarbonization and specifically the decarbonization on the operational side of the buildings, meaning, you know, after the building is complete. Um, as uh, Kirsten had sort of already indicated a little earlier in this in this conversation. The, there's also the embodied carbon uh, side of the equation, which is very important. Um, but today, I'll just be focused on uh, the operational side, which is primarily electrification and uh, you know switching away from fossil fuels. And so um, the uh, you know the idea of carbon and and the issue that carbon is 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 essentially carbon dioxide as an emission that gets into the atmosphere. It's a uh, greenhouse gas that has long-term effects, um, you know, long-term damaging effects on the environment. It's, it's what drives climate change. And it, it's what we need to address, you know, as a world community, if we're gonna be serious about uh, halting or slowing down climate change. So that's why we're talking about building decarbonization as architects. Um, I would just throw this slide up as a great resource, the Building Decarbonization Coalition. You can go to their website. They have fantastic resources here. Uh, there's a drop down specifically for designers that has all kinds of different reports. You can download as PDFs on, on, on a variety of different types, residential buildings, commercial buildings, you know, policy issues, all kinds of stuff. So I just threw that in just as a sort of a starting point, a great resource. Okay, so for in terms of climate change, um, you know, we all see all of these types of images all the time, probably so much that, that we don't really pay much attention to them. Here's the most recent. This is a, this is a, an image, a satellite image from just last month, 18th of March. And if you look at the picture there, you see a lot of color uh, with that dark red spot in the middle. If you notice that th what this is, is this is degrees away from normal in Antarctica. And um, if you notice that dark spot in the middle, there's no gradation in that color zone. It's just a solid color. And that's because it's off the charts. This, this, this image is up to 18 degrees difference. And on March 18th of this year, Antarctica was 70 degrees above normal uh, on that day. So just as a, you know, I know we see all these kinds of horrifying images all the time and it's, it's easy to sort of have them just get lost because they're so common, but this is one of the most recent. But if we wanna bring it back home a little bit, uh, climate change issues, this is a, these are some images from my house. Uh, when my daughter was young, we, we drew on the windows and we used to have fun taking a photograph as the moon rise came up each evening. There's a full moon rise on the left side framed in the, in the middle of that little flower. And we would do that for fun. But until recently that just was, something that was on our window we didn't pay much attention to. And then uh, you can see on September 8th um, of 2020, uh, that's actually the sun because, and that, you know, if the skies were clear, it, it's orange like that because of pollution. 
And if the skies were clear, you wouldn't be able to take that picture because it'd be too bright to point your camera in that direction. And it's, it just stopped me in my tracks. It was such an unusual event. I, I, you know, I stopped and took the picture just for fun, but I uh, thought to myself, wow, that's strange. But then lo and behold, the very next year, 2021 in August, it happened again. So, you know, this is something that's part of our lives now that we uh, need to deal with. And it's one of the best reasons why, you know, we really need to be serious about our climate change efforts. So some more images that we're probably pretty familiar with, but these are just some simple pie charts. And the one on the right uh, breaks out sort of where the uh, emissions come from in California, it happens to be 2019. And the building emissions here are only about 14%, which makes it seem like you know, not that big of a deal. Transportation obviously is a huge sector, but again, it's important to remember that in this pie chart, this is uh, not including the embodied carbon emissions. And if you do include the embodied carbon uh, emissions of buildings, then that slice of the pie gets much bigger for buildings and, and it and starts to compete with transportation in terms of the primary um, you know, carbon source in, in, our, in our environment. Uh, the pie chart on the right um, just breaks down the different uh, greenhouse gases by percentage. And so carbon dioxide you can see is basically two slices. And, takes up about 76% or something. But there's a hidden monster in this pie chart, which is methane. And although methane is only 16%, methane has 80 times the warming capacity of carbon dioxide. Um, the, the, it's not an apples for apples type of thing. Methane uh, dissipates more quickly uh, than carbon dioxide does in the atmosphere. In fact, all of the other greenhouse gases are measured against carbon dioxide when, when we talk about that greenhouse, the, the global warming uh, effect. Uh, but methane is still about um, 20 times more dangerous than carbon dioxide when it's released directly into the atmosphere. And, and the reason why that's important and the reason why it plays into uh, building electrification is because when we rely on natural gas, uh, natural gas essentially is methane. And that methane or natural gas needs to be gotten to our buildings in the, in the natural gas infrastructure and that is an incredibly leaky infrastructure. And so electrification in buildings is partially about eliminating the emissions immediately at the building, but it's also about eliminating the infrastructure necessary to support the combustion of fossil fuels. And, and if we do that, you know, then that's, that's a huge uh, slice of the, the pie that disappears. So, so short-term electrification to eliminate the immediate emissions from buildings, but long-term, we need to just eliminate all the risk factors that go with not just burning, but also transporting fossil fuels. So what does that mean? And this, so, so you know, today we're gonna to talk just specifically about electrifying residential buildings. And uh, this happens to be uh, my car. We were, uh, this is the, fir the first ho home that I fully electrified was down in Half Moon Bay. So I took the opportunity, uh, to, to put this 80 gallon electric heat pump water heater in my Chevy Bolt and uh, drive it down there. And so, um, you know, just, this was a couple of years ago, but uh, just to demonstrate the, you know, the, the commitment to electric, I guess. So um, what we're doing um, in terms of WeVolt is we're trying to help people to make this transition. And, uh, to do this, there, there's a number of things to consider. Um, and this chart kind of lays that out. And uh, we'll, we'll come back to this in another uh, later in the, in the presentation again. But just as a starting point, we, we've talked a little bit about the top bar there, you know, why it's important to address these issues. Um, the one thing that I would include in the uh, reducing your carbon footprint part is that there's also some nice uh, ancillary benefits to going electric besides just big picture climate issues. The biggest one being uh, indoor air quality goes way up when you eliminate some of these uh, combustion appliances in your home. The biggest one being the, the cooking appliance, of course. Um, and second being just uh, negative pressures induced as a result of combustion can have you know, adverse effects in, on, on the indoor air quality that I don't, I don't think people even realize. Um, for example, if you have a um, gas burning furnace and a natural gas burning water heater and one of them is on and the other one is, is not, the flu for the one that's inactive actually just becomes a, um, a, a way for air to 
you know, or that leftover combustion material to be drawn back into the home because uh, the combustion appliance that's on will create a negative pressure on the space around it, which will draw air back into the building, you know, through all kinds of places, but the flu on the other appliance is one of those places. So, and then of course the cooking appliance, um, you know, even with an exhaust vent, there's all kinds of data now that is making it clear that indoor air quality, specifically in your kitchen, just goes way down in the immediate um, time that you're preparing meals. And in fact, when we had all of the air quality issues in the past couple of years, you know, people got air air um, air quality monitors so they could actually measure the, you know, the, the specific quality of the air and and you know, there's charts which show that our kitchens are as bad as the worst fire days for short periods of time with a natural gas cooktop in your kitchen. So, um, you know, something to consider. Now, the other two areas in this, uh, in this are the opportunities and the options. And I'll start with the options and we'll just go through these sort of one by one and talk about them. It's kind of like the nuts and bolts of what's required to electrify your home, um, to the, the different components. And then the opportunities are, are how we can uh, sort of coordinate those uh, individual components and, and manage them to really optimize. And, you know, the, the, the intention is to save money, but it's also to uh, benefit the sort of the bigger grid picture. So um, <clears throat> let's get started on the, on the components. So, you know, as architects, we're all very familiar with this one and we don't need to talk about it very much at all, but building envelope is still the king. I mean, that's where you got to start on a building is make sure that your envelope is taken care of. And that means all of the usual things that we're all very familiar with, insulation, windows and doors, infiltration, you know, and then you can do things like low E barriers and attic fans and, and that sort of thing. And I'll say again and again, infiltration, that's the big one, especially in our climate zone. And when we're working on houses that have been in existence for a while, um, it's, it's the, it's the biggest contributor to the envelope typically. Um, but you know, they're all important. And, um, I also like this diagram here, uh, you know, just simply because it shows a, um, a heat recovery ventilation system, which is, you know, it's not really part of the talk today, but it is a, a nice, uh, component to consider when you're, when you're talking about electrifying and improving the indoor air quality of your building. So... So heat pumps, heat pumps are the, the MVP of electrification and um, they're a pretty incredible device. This is uh, just part of a heat pump. This is the condenser side of a um, mini split system. I included it, uh, this picture specifically in the snow because you know heat pumps get a bad rap. People say that they, they're not gonna function in cold weather, which is absolutely not true. And uh, you know heat pump technologies are improving all the time. And these heat pumps now operate regular, you know, most of them operate down to a negative 17 Fahrenheit. And there are heat pump manufacturers that are going below that now. So, um, you know, the idea that uh, cold weather prohibits you from having a heat pump um, is, is no longer, it's just a silly idea. Um, the, uh, the heat pump itself, um, if you're not familiar, we have, Heat pump is, is, a, is a general concept and we have them all around us. We live with them you know, in a lot of different places. Everybody has a heat pump in their house and the refrigerator. And all of us probably have heat pumps in our automobiles as part of the air conditioning system. And so what is a heat pump? Well, a heat pump is actually conceptually a pretty simple device. And the, uh, the, the, the bottom line is it's a device that, that re relies on one principle of physics, which is pretty cool, which is the vapor expansion cycle. And, uh, and, and that's, that's all there is to it. And, and the idea is that um, I think the thing that's the hardest for people to wrap their head around about, about a heat pump is how do they work in these extreme temperatures? Like how does a heat pump deliver cold air into your home when it's 110 degrees outside or vice versa? How does it deliver warm air into your home when it's you know zero degrees outside? And the answer is this vapor compression cycle. I mean, it truly is sort of a miraculous thing what it does what a heat pump does is it has a refrigerant in it and that refrigerant uh there's a number of different materials that work as refrigerant uh, but that refrigerant has physical properties that are pretty unusual um and and that is that when it changes state specifically from a liquid to a gas it absorbs a tremendous amount of energy and so what ha a, a heat pump unlike a gas furnace or electric resistance heat 
it's actually moving heat. It's not generating heat. So like if you turn on your furnace, it's, it's burning gas and you're, you're generating heat from that combustion process. But a heat pump is just moving heat in the direction that you want to move it. And the way that it does that is it takes this refrigerant and if you look at this diagram, it's, it's sort of going in a clockwise direction. And, and this is a, a heating uh, diagram. So imagine that refrigerant, it goes through that top component, which is the compressor. And it takes that refrigerant gas and it compresses it back down into a liquid. And by doing that, that refrigerant becomes very hot. I mean, we're talking, you know, in some, some even residential systems, temperatures way beyond like boiling point of water and 400 degrees, stuff like that. And so, in fact, commercial systems will reuse that residual excess heat. Um, residential systems typically don't, but there, that, that, that refrigerant gets so hot that it's passed through a coil on the inside of, of the building in this heating cycle, and, and air is passed over that coil, and that heat is transferred into the air and used, and, and the slightly cooler refrigerant uh, uh, as a liquid reaches the expansion valve. And when it reaches the expansion valve, it's, it's allowed to return back to a gaseous state. And by doing that, it absorbs a tremendous amount of energy and cools down. And, and then it's passed out through another coil on the outside of the building because its relative temperature is so much cooler, it can absorb heat even on the coldest days of the year. And when it does that, it makes its way back to the compressor. So it's, it's warmer coming back into the building than it was going out. It's compressed down, it gains even more heat and it just goes around and around. And so, you know, that's why a, a heat pump can reach efficiency factors of five, for example, whereas electric resistance heat is considered to be a one in terms of efficiency. It's actually slightly less than that, but just for the purposes of this, is, uh, imagine electric resistant as 100% efficient well, a heat pump can take it up to about five times that in terms of efficiency. So that's the, the basic concept. So we use heat pumps for a lot of different things. And primarily in buildings, we're going to use them for heating and cooling. And as architects uh, working with heat pumps, there's a lot of things, a lot of different things to, to keep in mind. Um, so I'll just run through a few of the, the topics here. First of all, we've probably all now heard the expression mini split. And, and a mini split is simply uh, a, a split heat, heat pump system that's ductless, um, but it gets a little confusing because they're so, they're so uh, effective and there's so much demand for these, they now have ducted components for the ductless mini splits, which sounds like a contradiction, but uh, a, a mini split is essentially a ductless uh, heat pump system. And what that means is that you have one condenser on the outside of the building and you have multiple coils inside the building. And we're probably all familiar with these. You see them commonly, especially if you travel through Asia or Europe, but it's that rectangular thing that's you know, up on the wall. You can get floor, model, floor modules or ceiling modules, but essentially what it is, is you have a number of zones in a building with a mini split system and the refrigerant circles or cycles to each of those locations. And there's a heat exchange that happens at that coil. It's usually room by room or zone by zone. And, and then, you know, super efficient um, because of the, uh, the location of, the, of the, the coil being immediately, you know, right at, at the um, location where the heat is needed. Now, like I mentioned, they have now added uh, ducted coils to these mini split systems which you can use in situations, and I'll show you some pictures of this, you can use in situations where, um, you know, you're essentially swapping out a gas furnace with a new uh, uh, mini split heat pump, um, and you still want to use the existing ductwork for the distribution. So uh, I should also say that these types of heat pumps are air sourced heat pumps. They're using the outside air as their, their heat exchange medium. Um, versus the next, uh, the next item on this list, the ground source heat pump, a geothermal system. And, and that's essentially the same concept. It's just not using air outside. It's using the, um, you know, the ground, which has a very stable temperature um, to uh, you know, transfer the heat. In our climate zone, it's very hard to make a geothermal system worthwhile. Uh, it's not to say we don't do them. In fact, I have a couple of pictures of one that we did. Um, I've done a couple of them, uh, but it's generally, we're doing them just because you know the people who are, are, are own the building just want to do the absolute highest efficiency option, and so we go to a geothermal. Uh, another 
option with heat pumps is hybrid systems where you combine the heating and the domestic hot water with a single heat pump condenser. And, and you, obviously you do that to save money because you're only buying one condenser. We have a, um, a mild climate zone here in the Bay Area specifically, but even where it's not so mild, this will work. Um, and usually it involves including uh, some storage capacity uh, in the form of water tanks, uh, tanks of water so that you can you know, store the hot water. Um, the heat pump generally is working uh, pretty hard uh, around the clock to keep those water temperatures high on the colder days. Now, um, another thing that I should mention about heat pumps that's different than um, uh, gas furnaces, for instance, is that they really do operate best at capacity, the most efficient at capacity. So, um, you know, we're all familiar with like efficiency ratings on gas furnaces, 96% efficient gas furnace, for example. Well, it's 96% efficient when it's burning. It doesn't matter if it's going on and off rapidly or if it's, you know, running for a long period of time. That's the efficiency of heat transfer. A heat pump is different in that you really don't want to over-design it. You want it to be sort of at the limit. So it's running at capacity on the worst case scenario day. So, Again, back to our climate zone, we're a heating climate zone. So on the coldest day of the year, you want your heat pump working at capacity, maybe even slightly beyond its capacity so that, you know, for 95% of the days of the year, um, you're completely covered and you're, you're that way you're ensuring maximum efficiency. So in terms of efficiency, the next, the next thing here is these, all of these acronyms that we all are so confused by, even me having doing this work, you know, I lose track of sort of what all these things are. We have, um, you know, EER, SEER, we, as architects, we see these things come up in our, um, you know, our Title 24 reports and stuff. So we don't need to spend a lot of time on this, but basically um, the two that are the, well, the three that are the uh, sort of the ones that come into factors, the SEER, which is a seasonal energy efficiency rating on the cooling side, HSPF, which is the heating seasonal performance factor, and UEF, which is the universal efficiency rating for water heaters. Um, and so, you know, those are the ones that we talk about a lot. And, and it's, it, it, the, the truth is, is that it's, you know, the, 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 the code is dictated by some of these, for example, uh, any air conditioning heat pump that's put in is a 14 sear minimum in California. That's going to change. It's going to go up here soon. Uh, HSPF, I think, is eight. But if you put in an eight uh, uh, heat pump with an efficiency of eight on the HSPF side, you're really doing yourself a disservice. It's it's not at all as you know as, as good as it should be. Um, but anyways, the uh, there is an organization which is the Air Conditioning, Heating, Refrigeration Institute, which rates all of these things. Um, and, and you know, it's a little bit like the uh, NFRC for Windows. Um, it, what they do is they 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 establish any common uh, well a heat pump. I should say it, it's a couple of components. It's the indoor component and the outdoor component, and, and you can mix and match a little bit. And so um, what uh, AHRI has is they give each system a specific rating, and you have to that rating has to meet your uh, Title Twenty Four requirement basically. Um, okay, the refrigerant types uh, and global warming potential. Um, this is going to be the conversation in the immediate future is, you know, these refrigerants are um, still, even though they're much better than they were 20 years ago, they're still dangerous, uh, you know, in terms of their global warming potential, very dangerous. In fact, just for a point of reference, they are rated against carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is considered to have a global warming potential of one. And the most common uh, refrigerant in some of these systems is what's called R410A. And it has a, a global warming potential of about 2000. That means it's 2000 times worse than carbon dioxide. Um, and so you can see how getting these refrigerants uh, to perform better uh, with lower uh, GWP is absolutely critical uh, in the in the coming years, and people are, are working on it already. In fact, I'm going to show you one heat pump in this presentation that uses carbon dioxide as the refrigerant, which is is pretty cool. So, all right, um, variable refrigerant flow. Now, this is the big change uh, in heat pumps recently, and that is. Um, 
this is what makes the mini splits so effective is that they have this variable refrigerant flow capacity. And what they're doing is, and, and people refer to it as different things. It, it's a, it's a variable speed inverter essentially is what it is. And, and, you know, we've all experienced like an air conditioning system that has two stages. It comes on and then it, you know, shifts into high gear kind of thing, you know, two speed system. Well, these systems are not that. They have a variable speed so they can go the full spectrum of speeds. And the way that they accomplish this is a little complicated, but essentially there's an inverter in the system which converts the power source from AC to DC and then they can run their components on a, on a DC electrical system. So they have a full range of speed in terms of the, the, the speed at which the uh, condenser runs. So I don't think we need to go into great detail on that, but just know that that's why the mini split systems in particular have these super high efficiencies that a lot of the other uh, heat pumps, standard heat pumps aren't going to get. And then finally, expectations, expectations, expectations. And what I mean by that is when you're an architect and you're working with your clients, you really uh, need to have the, and, and you're specifying a heat pump instead of a gas furnace, for example, you really need to talk to them about what the differences are. And, and you know they're not limitations or hesitations, they're just differences. And the biggest one is the way that a heat pump works. A heat pump is like a slow moving train rather than a blast furnace. And so people are used to their gas furnaces coming on at high temperatures and blasting warm air and then going off and then coming on again when, when the thermostat calls for heat. And a heat pump is very different. What it does is it runs at a cooler temperature. So it's delivering air through the registers that's typically like 90 in the 90 degree range rather than the 120 degree range. And it runs for a longer time with slower velocity. And so if, you're, if your heat pump system is designed properly, it should be on pretty much the entire day. It might change speeds, but it won't come on and off like a gas furnace system will. And so it's important to prep people for that because, you know, I, and I, I will say this just based on experience, you know, we put in new heat pump systems for people and we get a call immediately that they just think that it's not working. And, but it is working. It's just working at a very slow speed with the, uh, you know, with the warm air that's moving. In fact, you know, warm air moving past you uh, can actually feel cold if the, if the, wars, the air is not much warmer than, uh, you know, the ambient temperature of the room. So, you know, again, it's just important to um, let people know that there is a difference in the performance of these systems. And I think most people, in fact, I've gotten this phone call too, will, will come to realize that it's a better way, it's a nicer way to heat your house because you don't have that sort of blast of air going on and off uh, throughout the day and night. Okay, on to some specifics. So this it happens to be a geothermal system that we installed. This is in Piedmont. And um, this is kind of a, a interesting one. We use these big helical uh, heat exchangers that got dropped down into um, hole, pier holes that we had drilled in the, uh, in the, on the property there. And uh, specifically, they're underneath the driveway in the garage in this case. You can see in the picture that's on the right, the two guys that are installing that, that's actually in the location where the garage um, go, will, will be. In fact, there's a picture later that shows the garage. But these are the heat exchangers on the, on the outdoor side of a geothermal heat pump system. The water circulates through these tubes, each one of these big helixes you know, the water entered and exited at the top and, and you know, traveled the full course of it. And, uh, you know, I'll say this, we, we, this is an excessively designed, I mean, this is un, unusual for our climate zone again, but the water that goes out of that heat pump is at 34 degrees and the water that comes back from the ground is at 54 degrees, like almost without variation, no matter what time of year it is. So it's just a very, very stable place to exchange energy in the ground, which is why geothermal systems are so, so, um, efficient. More common are air sourced heat pumps. And this is a uh, condenser for an air source heat pump in Berkeley. This happens to be a single zone um, system. And, you know, pretty, pretty simple. We've all seen these around probably. Uh, as architects, I think there's a couple of things to keep in mind. Um, this picture shows it on brackets. And the reason why it's mounted on the wall on brackets is because you know, we, we all are familiar with setbacks and, and, and um, you know, restrictions on putting things in the setback. And one way to um, manage this is to mount it to the building, if, in Berkeley specifically, if you mount this device to the side of the building, you're allowed to extend back into the setback by uh, 18 inches. And so, 
Um, you know, in a lot of places, it's really hard to find a location for the condenser because, you know, it blows hot air, it blows cold air. You don't want it someplace like where people are necessarily outside, you know, in a, a deck area or something like that. And so you often do want to put them in the side yards. And uh, so, you know, you have to find ways to, to make it work if, if you're in fact infringing into a setback. The other thing to keep in mind um, is noise. And, you know, as a courtesy to neighbors, you always want to be conscientious about noise. There are, there are specifications as to what the noise limits can be. Um, generally, these uh, systems, you want to be below 50 decibels on the systems. Not all manufacturers reach that. Fujitsu, Mitsubishi, there's a number of them that their systems operate at 50 decibels or below. So, um, you know, that's something else to consider. Okay, this shows the other side of that type of system. This isn't the exact same system. This actually is a multi-zone system. Uh, so there's two uh, coils here, one below the other. This is a home in Berkeley where we removed a gas furnace from the crawl space and we uh, used it as an opportunity to zone the two-story house into two zones. Um, and so there's actually four zones on this system, but the other the other two zones are just little tiny, like they wanted an additional heat for, for an office space. So we put a, a tiny floor coil in that area. And the other one was for a, um, a bathroom. But these are the two primary zones. And so these, even though these are referred to as ductless systems, you can see we have ducts. These are the ducted components of a mini split system. And um, basically the cold air return is coming in on the right and the supply plenums are, are exiting on the left. And it's very, very typical to what you would see, uh, you know, in any other kind of an air handler. Um, the, uh, you know, the advantage to this is just, again, trying to reuse some of the existing duct work. Uh, not so much the duct work in the crawl space. We usually end up in replacing all of the duct work that's accessible, but you know, all of our existing buildings have duct work in the walls and in the floors and stuff that, uh, that is hard to get to sometimes. And so um, this is a way to re re reuse some of that, that duct work and register locations and, and still uh, you know, transition to an electric mini split system. This one happens to have MERV 15 filters on it, which um, is another conversation, but essentially we're getting to this place where air quality is becoming such an issue, especially during fire season that, you know, many people that are considering upgrading their heating systems want to talk about adding some pretty substantial air filtration systems as well. All right, so this uh, is th this is the same system as the air handles I just showed you, and uh, this is the condenser that goes outside, and and I include this slide uh, just again specifically for architects because it's very important to understand that uh, not all HVAC subcontractors are the same, and you really want to make sure that you bring in somebody that knows what they're doing because. Um, the efficiency of these systems is it, it's critical that the, the system gets installed correctly. And I've been a contractor and an architect for 20 years, and I never really paid much attention to this. I would hire HVAC subs all the time to put in, um, you know, heating systems that had air conditioning. And, and so over the years, I've seen a lot of things and I didn't realize some of the stuff I'd seen was so horrific until I got into this part of the business, uh, you know, in more detail, but, you know, I've seen people vent refrigerant straight off into the atmosphere. I've seen people not prepare the refrigerant lines properly and the systems, you know, they all still work to some degree, but it's absolutely critical that you, you understand the importance of proper installation. Uh, and so some of the components of that are system design and, and you know, this is another one where we've probably all had HVAC subcontractors show up to replace a heating system. They look at the existing heating system and they say, okay, well, that's, you know, 60,000 BTUs per hour. So we'll put in a 60,000 BTUs per hour. Well, if you're going from a gas furnace to an electric heat pump and you just swap it out size for size, you're going to do the client a huge disservice by, by giving them an oversized system that's not going to be efficient at all. And so you really want to have the, the system properly designed. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. Um, so let's jump to unit location. And, and that's sort of a condenser location uh, issue besides the you know, setback issues and stuff like that. There's performance issues on the, on the condenser. And so you, know, you try to optimize the performance by locating in places that are as well ventilated as possible. 
you know, ideally uh, uh, somewhat protected if possible. If it's a heating only system, putting it out in the full sun is not an issue, but you know, sometimes it's unavoidable. It has to go in the sun, but there's just things to consider in that regard. It's not as critical as some of the other components, but you know, certainly not to be neglected. Um, okay, refrigerant line preparation. Uh, I'll just go through these two th three things really quickly, but um, uh, you know, because it's really beyond the the scope of your architecture work. But just to give you an idea that it's important that these things are done well, refrigerant lines have to be you know basically purged with dry nitrogen, evacuated, and and done multiple times if necessary, based on on the uh, the readings. Uh, to determine if there's any moisture left in the system. It's critical. I mean, and, and again, this is one where I, for years and years and years, I've seen HVAC subcontractors just release the refrigerant into the system with never removing the atmosphere from the lines or, or even, you know, making any more effort than just, you know, putting the refrigerant in. But it's really critical that you get a clean, dry, evacuated uh, refrigerant line on the system for it to be as efficient as possible. And that even goes so far as proper, um, you know, connections. In other words, refrigerant lines are, are brazed rather than soldered. They get brazed together. And if, if somebody's not a qualified brazing you know, person, they can do brazing in a way that it completely contaminates the inside the line. So you know, just sort of to, to call attention to the fact that it is important that these things are done well. Uh, the refrigerant amount is another one that's you know, often uh, hard, over the head of, of the installer, but it has to do with the length of the refrigerant line and the devices that are attached to it. And it's, it's arrived at by uh, checking something that's called saturated, saturated temperature on the system, relatively complicated concept, but it's important that it's, it's done right. Or you'll end up with a system that's not operating at the proper pressures because there's, there's too much or too little refrigerant. And then finally, static pressure, which is the pressure again, uh, the pressure across the system at the air coil inside. There's a cold air return side of the system and there's a supply side of the system. And you want the static pressure to fall within the manufacturer's specifications or the system's just gonna work too hard and not be as efficient. So let's see. So back to system design, this is a couple of um, sheets that you're all familiar with as architects. This is from a um, Title 24 compliance report. And um, this is one way to do it. There's a lot of ways to do this, but basically the point is, is that you really want to design the system for the loads on the house. And so this is this happens to be a couple of pages from a report on an energy uh, model that we did for a house down in, in LA. And um, this house actually has four uh, different zones. And it, it, it in fact did have four different heat pumps. It was a pretty big house. Um, so this is two of the zones, the two of the bigger zones. But if you, if you look at this and I apologize, the numbers are a little bit hard to see, but you see that the, um, the, uh, the heating loads and the cooling loads are there. In this case, it's a cooling load dominated climate and the cooling loads are about 30,000 BTUs per zone, which is about two and a half tons. So in this case, we put in two ton systems to completely sort of uh, you know, top out the, uh, the, the uh, heat pump capacities and, and increase the efficiency or have the efficiencies be as high as possible. But again, just another reference to the importance of good system design. And it's not just the sizing of the system, but it's the duct work. And you know, there's a lot of different components that go into uh, an HVAC system design. It's to, to do it well, it's, it's not a casual uh, procedure. Okay, so that's it for the heating and cooling um, systems. We also use heat pumps for uh, our hot water now. And this shows a couple of different kinds here. Uh, the one on the left is a heat pump water heater that the tank and the heat pump are one single unit. This is the most common. This happens to be in Berkeley. Um, we installed this one in a little closet that was outside. It was a well-ventilated closet outside on the back of the house, which is why we added some insulation to the outside of the unit there. But you know, essentially it's very similar to a, a hot water tank, a natural gas hot water heater. There's a, there's a tank of, in this case, 50 gallons of water. The heat pump is on top. And um, you know, these, these water heaters are designed to operate in heat pump mode or a hybrid mode where they have electric resistance heat um, as backup if you need a little bit quicker recovery time. And you can also operate in just electric resistance heat mode, which I don't know why you would ever do uh, unless your heat pump had failed on the unit and you just wanted to have some hot water short term until you could get it fixed. But you know, basically we always uh, leave these in the most efficient mode. And for you know, a small household family of four, 
a 50 gallon unit like you see there on the left side is is sufficient and um you know they're they're pretty simple it's you, you, the water you have the water connections just like any water heater there's usually a condensate well there's always a condensate line that condensate is uh just distilled water so it can go into a uh it can go into a drain unlike a instantaneous gas water heater that also has a condensate line that you have to put out on the ground uh, and then the, the most challenging part of these is usually the electrical connection most of them are 240 volts, although there are now 120 volt models on the market also. Um, so it usually requires some electrical work, which is one of the bigger, um, you know, installation expenses. The one that's on the right is a, hot, a heat pump hot water that separates the heat pump from the tank. And so the tank goes inside or wherever is convenient and the, uh, the condenser goes outside or even uh, can be in a crawl space or you know, uh, under the house in, in a utility room or something like that, but it will generate cold air. This happens to be a company called Sand and now Eco2. Uh, I've installed a number of those, uh, maybe a half dozen or so, super impressed with this system. Has a coefficient of performance of over four, which beats the one on the left by, the, the, the one on the left is about 3.4, I think, for a coefficient of performance. So super efficient. Um, heat pump there on the right. The other impressive thing about the sand and uh, Eco2 is they're the ones that have started using carbon dioxide as the refrigerant, which is a very un unusual thing, but it's the it's the future. It's where, where heat pumps are going to, to end up. The other, uh, the nice thing about the sand and well, it's generally overkill for a single family residence because of the capacity of that thing. It's a 15,000 BTU per hour heat pump. And um, so oftentimes we're using that sand and unit as a hybrid system where we're using the same condenser for heating the house and heating the domestic hot water. Okay, the next big chunk of electrical or the appliances, um, I should say, uh, you know, the opportunities for changing from fossil fuels to electric are the appliances. The biggest being the induction range, the cooktop. Um, and it's also the hardest to sell. In other words, people are, you know, they're married to their gas cooktops. They just think it's the greatest thing. They think that, you know, pe most people feel like they don't want to go to an electric cooktop because, you know, they have these bad experiences of the old resistance electric cooktops. But we're talking about induction here, which is a different technology. And the induction ranges, uh, they use the magnetic frequency to actually heat up the vessel that you're cooking in. In other words, the pot the pot gets hot and it requires that you use specific kinds of cookware. Uh, the cookware has to have ferrous metal in it is essentially what it, what it means. You can't use aluminum or copper, but you can use anything that has iron in it. Or, so stainless steel works, but there's, there's um, you know, pots and pans that are specifically for induction that work better. Um, but the, the advantages to induction besides just being efficient and electric is that it's very fast and it's also very precise. And so um, anybody that says, you know, they don't like electric cooking, they're gonna stick with their gas, probably hasn't experienced induction cooking. And if they did have any opportunity to spend some time doing it uh, in a short period of time, they would probably come to like it more than their gas cooktop. The, um, the other cool thing about an induction is just has a flat glass surface. So when you're not cooking, it's just more counter space and that that surface doesn't get hot. So, I mean, almost immediately, once you remove a pan off of there, you know, you can put your hand on that surface and it's, it's not hot. Um, so, so those are two, two, you know, nice th sort of side benefits of induction, but the induction uh, you can also get, um, you know, on Amazon, they sell induction, uh, Cook, cook just like small cooktops that are like 60 bucks, you know, something countertop, little count portable countertop thing, if you want to give it a try. But anyway, so that's, that's where cooking is headed. You know, they've been using induction in Europe for, for decades, and, and we're finally catching up over here. Um, heat pump clothes dryer is the next, the clothes dryer is probably the next biggest gas appliance in the house. And um, the, uh, the heat pump clothes dryer is also a very efficient way to dry your clothes with electricity. Um, it, it's a condensing unit, so there's no exhaust necessary. Um, it's, uh, it's different than just an electric, uh, you know, dryer and that it doesn't use resistance heat. It uses a heat pump to generate the heat. But one of the reasons why they're so efficient is that heat pump 
just by definition has a coil associated with it that gets cold and that becomes the condenser. And so it's a very effective way to, to dry your clothes efficiently. Um, you might be experienced or you might have experienced condensing electric uh, dryers, like especially if you've traveled in Europe, they often have these and it takes forever to dry your clothes in those. And that's, that's just the, the nature of that condenser is it's using the ambient temperature of the room to condense the moisture out of the warm air. And so a heat pump uh, dryer is more effective because it has that cold coil as part of the, um, as part of the configuration already. Okay, so the other one's, uh, you know, electric grill. Uh, it's one of those things where I wasn't a believer. I did get one just because I want to go all electric. And, and I have to say, I'm very happy with it, actually. We've, we've uh, completely, we, we, we kept our propane grill around uh, for a while after that, but now I've gone completely to our electric grill for outdoor cooking. Um, you know, and then some of the other things, we talked a little bit about the HRV, heat recovery ventilators. Um, whole house fan we're probably all familiar with but that's a nice way to cool your house without having to rely on a heat pump that even uses less energy and then uh, electric fireplaces you know i kind of throw that in there with a little humor they are a thing and um you know there are led electric fireplaces now which you know some of them look pretty ridiculous but people are working very hard to make them look like fireplaces and um you know they include water vapor and fans and they can really have a uh, pretty close to realistic look in a fireplace, but I guess it still begs the question is why, you know, if you're going to, if you like a fireplace, uh, there's reasons for that, the hearth and all that. And I'm not sure an LED fireplace is ever going to be that, but there is an option if you're interested. All right, let's see. Okay, so um, next, uh, just a brief little bit about solar and you know we we talk about solar uh, obviously as architects we all talk about passive solar which you know should be the first and foremost on every project um, we don't need to spend any time on that but really it's the difference photovoltaics versus solar thermal um, solar thermal used to be a, a huge thing we're at the point now where conventional wisdom essentially says in all but very select cases, the, the best thing to do is just to maximize the sol solar photovoltaic system and, and use the electricity to do whatever else you need to do. If you're trying to heat water, it's probably more effective to just have sol solar photovoltaics with a heat pump water heater, unless you have a large swimming pool or something like that, that you're trying to keep warm, then maybe solar thermal uh, comes into play. This picture is a uh, property up in Inverness uh, that is 100% clean electric now. It's a, um, it's a part of uh, anybody that's familiar with Inverness. This is the boathouse uh, at Monka's. And so you can actually go there and stay there. Um, they, 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 this is like a bed and breakfast type arrangement. And uh, we have, with the exception of, we're waiting on the batteries, but everything else in this property has been converted to 100% clean electric energy. Uh, I'm standing, that's actually just a little studio out there. I'm standing on the roof of the main, the main building taking this picture. Just to show you how great my job is sometimes. This is the day that I was installing the heat pump at Mancos. This was the view that morning, so. Okay, so on to the next component, which is battery storage and microgrids. And here I say micro, microgrids, because microgrids is one of those words that's sort of hard to understand what, what people mean exactly. One definition of microgrid is a single building. And so if you have battery storage on your house, uh, there's some advantages, some reasons to do that. Uh, one of them is that you can be a microgrid and if the power goes out, you can still operate. And so, um, you know, that's, that's sort of a very, very small local application of the word microgrid. Um, but, you know, the idea of batteries has uh, more than just the, you know, if the power goes out kind of uh, mentality. You know, some people want to do islanding where they separate themselves from the utility altogether. But really, it's about optimizing the value of your electrical systems. And, and what I mean, mean by that, and we'll get into this in a little bit more detail, is a battery gives you, uh, you know, the opportunity to store energy and use that energy whenever you want. And so... Um, you know, when we talk, start talking about time of use rate plans and stuff, you'll understand how, how that becomes a critical component. Um, so it goes more, the batteries are more than just backup power, I guess is the point. Okay, and then we have our electric vehicles. And um, 
and V to G, which is vehicle to grid. Uh, you also hear some of these other acronyms, V to H, V to V. V to H is v to, uh, vehicle to house, vehicle to building, vehicle to whatever. The idea is that our cars have batteries in them or they will have batteries in them very soon. And um, the batteries in our vehicles are pretty robust. And you know why not use them rather than mounting a Tesla power wall on the side of your house, why not just use your car? And we are, we are very close to this being a reality here in California. Um, in fact, the new electric vehicles are already uh, designed to, to do this. And um, so, and there's hardware on the, on the market now to, to act as the inverter between the vehicle and the house. So, so we're, we're nearly good to go on this. But, you know, the idea is that the, uh, the car is going to be more than just something you get around in. It's going to be a critical component of your electrified home. And um, as a side note, this picture on the left is the driveway that has the geothermal tubes underneath it. So um, the diagram on the right, you know, the big difference there is the little, uh, the little indication in the very lower left corner of that diagram represents the utility. And, and the idea here is you can see that all of those arrows uh, the, the arrow between the car and the house and the arrow between the utility, those are bi-directional now so that energy can go in both directions. And the importance of, um, the importance of, of, of doing that is, is gonna be more clear when we talk about other microgrids here in a minute. Okay, I see that there are a couple of uh, questions here on the chat. So um, how noisy are the induction cooktops? Um, so I can't hear our induction cooktop at all, but I will admit this, which is that we had an inexpensive induction cooktop at our house uh, when we first got interested in this and our little dog could hear it. And so um, our daughter figured out finally that our dog was hiding underneath the sofa every time we did some induction cooking. And so we did a little bit of investigation and um, realized that some of the lower perform or the lower less expensive um, models had this issue. And I've heard other people say that, you know, their kids can hear the frequency. Um, now, I've never, uh, when, once we replaced our, you know, super cheap induction trial model with a, a regular, uh, we actually ended up with a, um, a Bertazzoni, I guess, but, um, you know, Bosch, all of these, I've never heard of any complaints about noise in that regard, uh, or even with pets and noise. And, um, Let's see, the other question, I think nuclear is the only way to go if houses and cars are all electric, what is your opinion? Well, that, that's actually a, a pretty big question. I, I think that nuclear is a, is a critical player at the moment, but I think that other renewable sources uh, could, could uh, take over uh, and replace all that. I mean, when you look at you know, these, these ideas of how many solar panels would it take to uh, you know, power the entire United States. It's like some small fraction of the state of Arizona, for example. There's enough solar energy landing to power the entire country. So um, you know, I think that um, obviously that kind of capacity in solar requires a lot of considerations in terms of storage and transmission and all that kind of stuff. But um, I, I, I personally don't think that nuclear is the only way to go. I think renewable sources like solar and wind are going to be the, pri the primary players. We're, we're already at about 20% of the grid in California. And, I, and I'll show you a graph um, in a few slides that, that'll show you exactly where California is at in this regard. So, okay. All right, finally, the last piece of the uh, electric home is the electrical panel. And uh, now I use the word microgrids in a little bit broader sense, um, which is the more common usage. But, you know, here's the basic idea is that we're all familiar with our houses being consumers of energy. We've all paid our utility bills, you know, our whole life. Um, and we're very familiar with the idea of our houses being generators of energy, you know, once we started seeing solar systems go up on the roof. And we're now getting to the point where the idea of our, our buildings being storage devices is becoming more and more common with batteries and thermal storage, meaning hot water tanks and stuff like that. And so the last piece of this puzzle is how do we share these resources amongst one another? And there's a lot of different um, a lot of different companies working on pretty smart, cool applications here. You know, people are using blockchain to, to figure out how to share energy value. And what I have here uh, on the left side is a, um, 
This actually happens to be a local company span. They're developing a smart panel. It's just coming to market. This is not easily available yet. Um, in the projects that I've included a smart panel, we've sort of constructed our own out of using, using Leviton Wi-Fi breakers and third-party software to manage those breakers. But basically, you can see here, there's an there's a image of a, a, a phone app. This happens to be the SPAN app. But you will be able to control you, all of your devices, all of your electrical loads through an app like this. And the reason why this becomes critical is because it's about um, some of the strategies we're going to talk about in the next uh, segment of, of the talk. But basically, um, once we're sort of optimizing all of our electrical use and trying to maximize our, our efficiencies, um, time of use and you know amperage and stuff like that all becomes critical. And that's why the smart panel um, really becomes a key player in allowing you to prioritize and um, you know sort of manage your loads. And, and the idea is that once we are able to do that and we are sharing you know, in, with, our, with our micro grid, we can really truly begin to decentralize uh, you know, the infrastructure more because you, know, you could have uh, solar systems within, within a, a, a smaller uh, configuration like shown in the diagram, there would be some sort of a control system, microgrid control system, but you would be sharing energy locally. In other words, let's take for example, um, uh, one single street. And, and like my residential street here in Oakland, we actually talked about this a little bit amongst ourselves as a community. You know, not all of the houses on the street have capacity for solar because of shading issues, but a lot of the houses do. And so, you know, it's, it's in theory, you know, using something like a blockchain application, um, you know, if it was developed and, and accessible, we could potentially have solar systems on some of the houses and still provide 100% renewable local energy for all of the houses. And so that's sort of the idea is to be able to facilitate things um, that are, uh, you know, a little bit more uh, conducive to uh, cooperation. So, all right, I'm looking at the chat here and I see that there's some questions I missed. Let's see. Um, this is kind of a good, good time to, to clear, clean up the questions because the, uh, we're going to shift back now. Well, yeah, we're going to shift back to um, combining the, using strategies to optimize things. So let's see. All right. Trying to convince clients to use the Sandin. Uh, but when they considered future wildfires, they wanted cooling to be able to. Yes. Okay. So, can can the sand and use cooling? And is it true that heat pump water heaters are loud? All right. So, the sand and cannot do cooling. Uh, it's stand the sand and in particular is just a heat pump, uh, heating water. It just it generates heat for hot water. Um, Let's see, there are, there is, there actually is a local company right now that's working, um, uh, the name of the company is Harvest Thermal, and they are working uh, on using, they have a, they have a really slick um, load shifting uh, hardware, and they use the Sandin as part of their heating system, and they are introducing cooling into that system, uh, haven't, they haven't managed it yet, but they're working on it. Um, heat pumps loud. So uh, the heat pump water heater noise issue is something that, um, should be considered. They they do make noise. There's a fan on them, and I do. I will admit that I've gotten complaints from clients after we've installed them, and um, some manufacturers are better than others. Uh, so A.O. Smith, for example, uh, makes a great uh, price point. They have a great hot water heater, heat pump water heater with a good price point, but it's noisier than the Rude and the Ream in my experience. And so if it's if I'm locating these water heaters in some place where it's critical the noise is potentially going to be an issue. And we're not talking about a lot of noise. We're talking about the sound of a fan, um, uh, but it's different than the sound. I mean, to be quite honest, a, a combustion, combustion water heater makes noise too. Um, but when you install one of these appliances, people's houses, it's a new noise. And so people typically notice it. Um, and uh, so the rude water heater and the ream water heater, I've, very, I've had very good luck with those in terms of the level of noise. Um, but they're not silent. The, the sand and actually, even though the condenser goes outside, that is the quietest heat pump 
I've ever seen. I mean, that thing, I honestly can't even tell it's operating unless I look and see if the fan is moving, even if I'm standing right next to it. So that's the quietest heat pump out there. That condenser, you know, typically goes outside, but um, there, you know, that, that is an option if, if noise is, is really a, a big issue. Um, I have a heat pump water heater in my house under, it's down in the utility space below our living space. Um, and it's not an issue at all. I mean, we just can't, you can't hear it through an insulated floor. Uh, as we volt the consulting firm that we could contact in the future for system and equipment recommendations. Uh, that's exactly what we volt is going to be. We are on the, on the cusp of launching. We've been working on these things for, um, I've been working on this new business for about a year or so. We, we do our installations um, as part of my previous, well, still business, Green Hammer Design, which is a construction company, but <clears throat> WeVolt is a consulting business. That's right. Okay, how are we to answer the rest of these, I think. I'd like to address local companies who you think are good for installing mini split type units to get it done right. Um, Let's see, the question is whether I'd like to make recommendations for good companies. Uh, I, I hesitate to do that. There certainly are a few uh, that I'm aware of. I don't know all of them and I'm sure I'm certain there's a lot of good companies out there. Um, I, there there's also a lot of bad companies I'm aware of, which I could you know, list by name as well. But I, I think uh, I wanna stay away from that kind of information in the presentation here. Okay. Okay, I had a comment from uh, Dan Johnson, which is, uh, I think that's, let's see. Yeah, maybe we should hold that one till the end, Dan, just because it's a little more complicated than just a quick answer. Okay, and I can't speak to any of the two questions that uh, were asked about uh, wind turbines and uh, very uncommon that you'd use a wind turbine on a residence, uh, although not impossible. And I don't, I'm not familiar with the photovoltaic or the solar panels that are asked about there. So I'm gonna skip that. Okay, um, to continue on here, just a quick little detour, this is that same house where you can see the geothermal and the electric vehicle, just to give you a sense of the fact that even in a, this house happens to be a, a house that's in Piedmont that's built in 1880, which we brought up to current uh, clean electric energy practices. I'll just show you a few pictures for fun. That's the back of the house there you see on the right. Um, the client happens to be a student of uh, Christopher Alexander. So we did a little homage to Christopher Alexander design there on the back of the house. Christopher Alexander, for those of you who know, just passed away last month. So um, sad news to hear that. Um, and if you're not familiar, he's the author of Pattern Language Teacher at UC Berkeley, very world renowned uh, in his theories. Okay, uh, I'm trying to figure out here how to get my slideshow to advance. This is a picture inside that house just for, for fun. This is a house, I'm, I was the architect and the builder on this project, um, you know, just to show that the uh, older houses can be retrofit. This, this interior here in terms of decarbonization, all of this woodwork is all reclaimed. Um, it's, it's either clad with redwood or those in a couple of cases of large redwood pieces. Those two big beams in the ceiling came from a bridge up in Mendocino and uh, the rest of it is all uh, reclaimed material. Let's see. Okay. So now on to the, uh, back to this chart, onto the opportunity side of this grid, um, load shifting, load management, so that stuff. Um, and this is where bringing all of the electrical pieces together effectively, um, you know, is gonna be important, so. First one is rebates, 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 rebates. There's a ton of incentives available right now uh, for a lot of these projects, a lot of these equipment. Energy Star, of course, you can always go to Energy Star and type in your zip code and they'll come up with rebates that are, you know, beyond electrification stuff, building envelope improvements, stuff like that. Um, 
There's a couple of larger players, Bayran and California Clean Tech, which are uh, going to be one and the same, is my understanding. But there's there's big incentives for a lot of the uh, components that we talked about in the neighborhood right now. Uh, if you're re replacing a um, gas heating system with a heat pump and a gas water heater with a with a heat pump water heater, you can in some areas in the Bay Area get seven thousand dollars with the rebates total right now. Um, so, you know, really a, a good time to be uh, getting these things installed. Um, tax credits, you know, we're all familiar with the solar, when you inst solar installation, 26% currently. Uh, there's also just tax credits for heat pumps and heat pump water heaters. I think it's in the neighborhood of $300 per unit. Um, it can be taken, my understanding is it can be taken retroactively all the way back to like 2012. So if you happen to have done that and didn't take your tax credit, you can still do it. Um, it might be a $500 cap total for both, but that's uh, on the federal side of things. And then there's also uh, manufacturer rebates, which are a moving target. You know, it happens, they, they come and go. I know that when I purchased my heat pump dryer for my house, uh, we got a $300 manufacturer rebate from Miele on that. So usually something in that area. So that's the incentive side of things. All right, I'm not gonna spend a lot of times on this because these, these get pretty complicated pretty quickly. But you know, the first idea is uh, net energy metering for anybody that has a solar system. And I'm sure that you know, you've all heard in the news lately, there's so much uh, debate about what that is and what it's going to be. We're currently, I uh, guess, uh, phasing out uh, net, net, net energy metering 2.0 heading into 3.0 and people are really pissed off because what they're basically doing is taking it from retail rates in terms of the energy you generate down to a lower uh, utility rate for your payback. So, uh, but the idea is that if you're generating energy um, when you're not using it, you're getting value for that. And uh, it becomes an important variable in the equation um, when we start talking about the next item just time of use rate plans. And all of us are now on time of use rate plans as of May of last year, I think. Um, but basically you have options here and, and I, these, this doesn't show all of the options, but the three primary options um, of a time of use rate plan. And again, I don't think it makes sense to spend a lot of time on the nuts and bolts of this, but you know, just to know that depending on your rate plan, you can have you know, different, uh, the, the cost per kilowatt hour is, is different. And you can strategize that uh, application of that rate plan and combine it with some of your other uh, electrical appliances to really kind of optimize the value. Um, and that all becomes, uh, both of those things become uh, important when you start talking about load shifting and load management. And, and so here I show a, a graph um, that is, I think uh, two days ago in California, it shows the um, uh, the, the supply side of the energy grid in California, uh, the green line being renewable energy. So you can see that at about 7, 7.30 in the morning, renewables go you know, much beyond any of the other energy sources on the grid. And so ideally, um, you know, that's when we should be using our, our energy. Um, you, know, you factor in your, or you overlay peak use rates versus non-peak hours on this graph, and it gets a little more complicated. Uh, but basically, this is what we're trying to address is we're trying to help people really optimize the value of their electrification by recognizing the importance of time of use rates and renewable energy on the grid. And, and you can use, you can use um, you know, methods of load shifting to further uh, optimize this. And, and to do that, basically what, what that means is you're, you're using energy when it's sensible to use energy and saving it and, and, and then dissipating that energy locally from your, you know, whether it's your battery storage or your thermal storage, your hot water tanks during hours when it's not sensible to be pulling energy from the grid, peak hours essentially. And so um, again, there's this uh, company in, um, uh, locally here, uh, that's got a great new product that's doing this, uh, and that what they're doing, it's harvest thermal and what they're doing is, and I think Dan is part of that, if I'm not mistaken, uh, who's on the chat, but, um, you know, harvest thermal has this great product where they are taking a sand and water heater and combining it with their, uh, their device and, and giving you the, um, 
you know, real opportunity to load shift and, and increase the performance of that sand and water heater to absolutely maximize its efficiency beyond its capacity even. So in other words, it's a 15,000 BTU heat pump, which essentially is, is, is effectively operating as a 30,000 BTU heat pump by optimizing this idea of, of load shifting. So, um, you know, this is gonna be a critical component of making these electric homes uh, really sort of, you know, hum and purr and, and operate great is, is, is stuff like that. So both battery storage and thermal storage are gonna be critical players. And then finally, um, load management. And what I mean by that is, you know, people often uh, get the great idea to go all electric and then they find out that they immediately have to upgrade their electric panel. And there's a huge expense or, or you know, time constraint or something like that. And it just is discouraging for them. And so it, load management is another uh, thing that the smart panel is critical in, in helping people do. And what that does is it allows you to prioritize loads so that you don't have the co coincidence of high amperage loads simultaneously uh, requiring you know, a huge service. In other words, it's my opinion that a single family home uh, in the Bay Area should easily be able to operate on a 100 amp service and not have to go to a 200 amp service. Now, obviously there's some exceptions to that, but you know, if you get a lot of these uh, you know, heat pump installers out on the job site or you know, electric uh, vehicle is added to the equation and people immediately say, oh my God, you need 200 amp service. And um, I just don't think it's necessary. I think that if you're you know, intelligent about how you construct your electrical load pattern, you can uh, maintain a, uh, a residence, single family residence very comfortably on 100 amps. Um, having said that, I'll, I'll say this, my house uh, is on a 60 amp service and we're 100% electric. Um, you know, obviously I, I do more, more load management than most people would be willing to do, but just to make the point that it's, it's not impossible, so. Okay, so that's it. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions here in the box. Let's um, oh, let's sorry. open up. Oh, sorry, Tim. I was just gonna say let's open up to Q and A if people want to um, ask you. Okay. Yeah. Too, but I don't want to. I didn't want you to. I didn't mean to interrupt your slide presentation. Well, I wasn't interrupting. I was just gonna finally close with this. Don't forget that Sunday night is our. Lunar eclipse. I threw this in just for fun. It's going to be a pretty, we'll have a good opportunity to see it here in California, starting right at sundown, which is moonrise. So, just sort of as a final thought. Yeah, Tim, so, I'm going to go ahead and unshare my screen, I guess, and we'll take questions. <clears throat> you just, uh, I think people can just jump in. I, I, I don't think there are too many people. Raise your hand. And, yeah. Oh, here's yeah, I kind of lost track of the chat here. So, yeah. Dietmer? Hi. Yeah. Thanks for the great presentation, Tim. That was really great. Sure. One quick comment on the uh, setbacks for equipment. I did some arm wrestling in Berkeley when the new ADU rules were written. And so, and I think so far it's only for the ADU rules, but in Berkeley, you can now project two feet into required setbacks, and that includes mechanical equipment specifically. Oh, great. Uh, yeah, that's great. Both condensers or uh, heat pump water heaters, you do have to maintain a minimum two foot setback. So if you have a typical four foot side yard, uh, then you, know, you can stick two feet in, which gets pretty much any uh, condenser in, whether it's wall hung or ground mounted. And uh, uh, you might, you, you might be able to get a really small heat pump water uh, heater in, but that, that's still going to be tight. So yeah, that's that. that. Then I had a question for, you showed the picture of the uh, two sandwiched uh, concealed uh, slim yeah. duct units. Mm -hmm. um, uh, with a MERF 15 filter, were you able to do this with a regular static unit or did you have to go to the more expensive medium or high static units? Well, okay. So uh, yes, we have been able to do it with the medium static units. I'll, I'll confess in that sp specific one, the client was on board with us experimenting. And so what we were doing there actually was trying to use a, um, a low static unit and we added additional um, uh, 
duct fans in there to balance the pressure. So yeah, it's not completely that. a fair presentation yeah. point. So that's mm -hmm. kind of why I brushed past it quickly, yeah. but you're, mm -hmm. you're on topic there. Static pressure is critical. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why we can't just throw some of these higher performing filters onto a mini split ducted system for sure. Yeah. And on that same installation, while we're talking about that, I noticed those were just kind of threaded rods hanging from a unit strut. Uh, in your experience, are these installations done with sound and vibration isolation, such as kind of neoprene or rubber yeah. washers or springs? How were they installed? So that one is, in fact, we always do use a, a sound dampening of some sort there. Mm -hmm. um, we did have a um, situation on one of our installations where we had suspended it like that, and um, they still were able to feel a mild vibration uh, uh, specifically on their dining room table somehow. Like it was one of these, you know, times where we were all working at home and he was working on his dining room table. And so, you know, we, in that case, we actually did switch and we, we mounted it or we, we reversed the mounting and supported it from the ground just to separate it from the structure. Um, mm -hmm. But we always do include and recommend that there are, you know, sound dampening uh, devices in there. That's great. Uh, a quick comment on the, on the span IO, you know, like yeah. that panel that you yeah, showed, yeah. I looked into that for projects about $7,000. Yeah, so it's very, ex very expensive. And yeah. uh, I'm glad to hear that you were able to pull something together with Leviton, you know, yeah, like- Leviton costs us about 1500 bucks for a panel and breakers. Okay, okay. Yeah. to do the whole thing. Yeah. And then I should note for people that want to do this, if you have um, uh, battery storage or Enphase has something now, which is called sunlight backup, where you don't need batteries, you can just use the real-time power during the day, during an outage, as that's for emergency resilience. And Enphase has load controllers built in that do manage the load. So it's similar to an, a smart load panel that basically dials down loads as it's based on availability of sunlight at any time. So all of this is really, I can only second what Tim uh, outlined. This is at the verge of coming in terms of bi-directional charging, V2G, V2H and such. But uh, anybody who gets into that, good luck. I mean, you're really, we're really at the very, very leading edge of this. Uh, most installers, they know nothing about it. Even yeah. I have, every time we do PV, I have to educate the solar installers. There's a huge lack. And part of it is they're so busy doing what they're used to do, just throwing panels on the roof as far as the PV goes. So this next level of into smart control and integration, that's going to be a heavy lift. And I think we need to play a big role in this to push this along. Yep. So thank you for your presentation. Yeah, hey, you're welcome. Thanks, Chair. Let's see, anybody else have questions? That was a lot, a lot to absorb, Tim. Yeah, I know, it's a lot of information. I, I do see a question here about Bayren. Uh, GCs are resistant to participating. Uh, that's absolutely true. And, and, and the thing is, is it, it's just, it takes, it, you know, it takes a quite a bit of effort to get through their onboarding process. And the thing that turns off most contractors is the ex insurance requirements. Uh, specifically, you have to go to a commercial auto policy, which is pretty expensive if you don't already carry it. So yeah, there are some hurdles there, but certainly they have more and more contractors enrolling all the time. So... If there's no other question, I have one more quick comment on the put on the line sets for the for the uh, um, uh, mini split systems, like the refrigerant yeah. line set that gets yeah. run. So what I tend to put in the specs is to really make sure that you protect the lines. You know, like wherever they go through a wall cavity, where there are people that might put a nail in the wall. You know, it's like say put a metal shield over it, like a half round gutter yeah. or something, galvanized gutter that you just put over it. So you hit that first and you know, oopsie, maybe I shouldn't pound this nail in any further. And yeah. sure enough, on a recent job, you know, the contractor didn't take that seriously and they still doing construction, put a nail through it. And then <laughs> they, and, and this is terrible because you're losing, you're literally using 10 years of environmental savings compared to a high efficiency gas unit uh, yeah. in terms of venting all this refrigerant, it's bad. And, uh, so that's, of course, a kick in the gut environmentally. But then to add insult to injury, they just said, oh, no, we have the walls all closed up. Let's just abandon the line set. They ran another one. 
on the outside of the building, you know, with the white foam. Yeah. And it's just unbelievable. So you really have to be, as this is all new, uh, and many HVAC installers, that is, again, testament to find the right people to do it. And if it's a company that hasn't done it before, you really have to lean in and watch what they're doing and very carefully uh, accompany the, um, the process to make sure that it doesn't end in mayhem. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that local company for load shifting with uh, via the Sandin system. What's the name of that company? That's uh, Harvest Thermal. Harvest Thermal, okay. Yeah. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah, they have a really, really impressive product. Yeah. I mean, it's just yeah. something that is gonna be a big player mm -hmm. here. And then maybe one last thing I have on my list here, and then I'm through really, is the proper sizing of the mini split systems. And, um, you know, I have somewhat mixed feelings about that because I, you know, I think the risk, of course, you don't want to ridiculously oversize, but there's also a risk in undersizing. I had, there's some reports of uh, systems not achieving their rated output because of de-icing issues. You know, most of these systems are designed for cold and dry climates like the Midwest. And, uh, you know, there is not a big de-icing problem because there's 20% relative humidity. In the mm -hmm. Bay Area, when you get these cold periods, when you are in your 99% uh, 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 design temperature range, it can often be pretty moist. And then uh, these things I get iced up, you know, on the, on the condenser side, on the cold side. And then for 20 minutes, they're busy de-icing. And uh, so, and that could really kind of put a wrinkle in the equations. And on the other end, you know, I think some, I have always tended to strategically oversize, I don't know, 20, 30%, knowing that the system as its variable flow or variable, variable speed, it can just very calmly modulate down to 30% output of its rated output or so. And it still maintains the same efficiency pretty much. So it's really, you, you never want to oversize it that much that it begins to short cycle and cycle on and off. But you have a huge range of, you know, and in terms of equipment costs, sure, the larger units cost a little bit more, but it's not significant, you know, like mm -hmm. on the, because literally uh, three quarters of that stuff is labor. We had things, single zone systems put into a garage conversion, a Home Depot unit for $900. And the guys were there from, from nine till two and sent the client a bill for $4,000. Well, that three quarters of that was half a day of labor, right? That's the problem. Nobody's really geared up for it. But my sense with the sizing, maybe that's an off topic or a side discussion among yeah. people yeah. that do this routinely. Dan Johnson probably will jump into that too. But that I would like to uh, get into more depth uh, about that at some point, if you have, if you are available. Yeah, I mean, it, it is a, it is a complicated question. And, and the other thing, the other side of that, or the other part of that component is, you know, with these mini split systems, we're often into multi-zone multi -zone configurations that we weren't previously. You're taking out a single zone system, putting a multi-zone system. And so, um, and you know, if people are strategic about their settings inside the house, or a lot of these heads on these mini splits are not even active unless you, you know, pick up the remote and turn it on, you know what I'm saying? And so, um, you know, oversizing, I think uh, you're right. The variable flow refrigerant really addresses a lot of that. Uh, but, you know, the other, the other thing is that in, in theory, we're just going to be more efficient in our heating pattern, heating and cooling patterns simply due to that multi-zone configuration. So there's a benefit there too. So, you know, that might, might speak to the fact that, you know, sizing right to the limit of the, uh, you know, coldest day of the year, for example, uh, might be the sweet spot. Hey, Tim, um, people have requested that you share your contact info. What's the best yeah. way to get a hold of you? Uh, so it's probably just my, my email, which is just, uh, let's see, I, I don't actually have anything to put up on the screen with that, but um, it's Tim at wevolt.net, and wevolt is hyphenated, so W-E hyphen V-O-L-T dot net. Well, thank you so much. It was a fantastic yeah. presentation. Uh, well, thank you tons of information. My brain is scrambled right now. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. thank you for taking the time to do it. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Tim. Sure. Thank you. It was my pleasure.
Glad to do it.